Good morning, my dear friends. <laughs> so thankful that you joined me today again for Bible study. I actually took a nap and it's now the middle of the night. Matter of fact, I uh, had started reading my Bible and uh, I fell asleep in my second reading and, uh, and I said, well, I'll just I knew I was going to fall asleep and said, I'll just wake up uh, and finish my study. Sometimes you need some rest. I mean, it's been a tough week. And uh, so I did get up. Matter of fact, when I turned on this camera, it was 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. And uh, 3.16 in the a.m. And uh, I'm, I was up reading the Bible again. And caught up on some uh, Revelation study that I'm doing with some other people from Luxomity Baptist Church in Georgia. It invited me to join in their Revelation study. And it's a, a hearty book to be studying, <laughs> full of good food, uh, wholesome meat. <laughs> and uh, I also had some potatoes, some potato chips, meat and potatoes. Uh, so today, uh, continuing in Samuel, uh, Saul is anointed king. Saul goes out looking for some donkeys that, it, that had run away from his father. Well, Saul sometimes acted like a donkey, like we all do, unfortunately. Uh, but he's out looking for his father's donkeys, and he's been gone for a few days, traveled a lot of country, and... Uh, Oh, that I could go out and climb and travel that way <laughs> for a few days. I, I enjoy being out and doing that. Just me and the Lord or me and some other brothers in the Lord and sharing and fellowship. But Saul continues out and... Uh, his servant said, well, before we go back, because I know... Saul was concerned that his father was starting to worry about him. He would go out back home and forget about the donkeys. But the uh, the servant said, let's go see the seer that is in this town. Now the seers, uh, what they used to call the prophets. And the prophet that, that he's talking about is Samuel, the prophet of prophets. Samuel is an amazing man. Uh, remember that his mother, Hannah, dedicated him uh, to serve the Lord his entire life. And he has done just that. And uh, the people asked him for a king. And God said that they had rejected him, not rejected Samuel. And that he would give them a king. They would regret it. So Samuel is anointed uh, the king today. What happens is he he goes to see the seer, Samuel, and Samuel is told that Saul is coming. He said, tomorrow, God tells him, tomorrow at this time, a young man is going to come to you, and he is the one that you are going to anoint to be the king, and tells him about him. And sure enough, as uh, Saul is coming up to find Samuel, Samuel comes out and greets him and invites him to come up to the high place where they're going to have a meal. And there is a special place set for Saul and a special portion of meat, which was the surely the juiciest, biggest piece of meat he, he could ever hope to eat. That was brought out especially for him. 
And he was like, oh my goodness, I didn't even know I was coming here. And here this man is greeting me and, and treating me like a king and giving me the choicest peace, putting me in the seat of honor. And, uh, and then Samuel told uh, him to tell the servant to go on ahead of him. And Samuel told him uh, that he was going to be the king. He anointed him with oil, told him where he was going that day, told him who he was going to meet along the road that day, and told him uh, that his father's servants would meet him and would be worried about him and not the donkeys. The donkeys had been found. And uh, and then also that he would meet a group of prophets and that he, when he met them that he would be transformed and he was anointed and became a prophet that day. Samuel, the prophet, uh, I mean, uh, Saul, the prophet. Uh, so Saul was anointed became a prophet that day and he was a prophet and a king it's amazing the start of his journey was so bright and hopeful he had everything that he could hope for to be successful in leading this nation and he had humility he had tremendous humility and It's uh, a terrible shame how pride can bring men down, and it, it happens in Saul's case. And uh, so we'll learn more about Saul along the way, but today was an amazing day in Saul's life. And uh, if we can learn anything from Saul's life, it's... Uh, that we don't ever want to forget where we came from and what the Lord has done to us and that we should hold fast to the journey that he started us on. And I've had troubles along the way. Started out strong and uh, became very waning in some of the years of the last 20 and not holding fast and becoming weak and and it really showed and it's a terrible shame that we allow these things to happen to us but thank goodness for God's restoring spirit and uh, I praise God for that <laughs> and but don't forget the lessons of Saul, how high God can lift you up and how far you can let yourself fall if you don't hold on to God. Hold on to that root. Going on, I'm going to open up the Bible. Uh, the book of Romans is, of course, rich and full of some amazing words, but it really talks about uh, our root. Our, our root versus God's root is pretty amazing because uh, our root is not a good one <laughs> because we have the sin nature that we were born into. Uh, because of the fall in the garden so many years ago, we have the blood of that fall in ourselves. And so I'm going to read the entire chapter of three, and it's not a long chapter at all. And so Paul, he says, what advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision much in every way chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God for if some did not believe 
with their unbelief, will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar. Let me say that again. Let God be true and every man a liar. God's truth is here in the Bible. Don't forget what's here in the word. And if any man speaks contrary to what God's word says, let God be true and every man a liar. Let that be true. And so it says that that you may become justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. We can be justified in our words if we're speaking God's words, if we're living them out. And we can overcome when we're judged if we put our faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But if your right unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, that's pretty mind-boggling. <clears throat> what shall we say? Is God unjust to inflict who inflicts wrath? If when we do bad, God does good, shall we do more bad so God can do more good? No. <laughs> and it and, uh, says, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? And then Paul says, I speak as a man. This is human reasoning that he's using here, talking to us like we would be thinking. Certainly not, for then how is God to judge the world? Or how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? So if my sin really proves the truth of God, shouldn't I, why am I still being charged as a sinner? I'm helping God out by being a sinner. No, <laughs> that's not, that's not what God wants us to do. Yes, our sin does show the righteousness of God as being the truth. Our sin shows that sin is just folly. And I'm trying to, let me turn this camera away from that light. Uh, our sin, our sin, <laughs> our sin just proves our folly. Our sin just proves that God's word is so true and that nothing apart from walking in his righteousness, is going to produce anything of any good effect. And that only the blessings are going to be shown through a life that is walking before him. In his word, walking and following his statutes, and his law. And so, there's no blessing, but no only curses follow our own folly so let's walk in his word so so let me say that again for if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory why am I still judged as a sinner and why not say let us do evil that good may come as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say. So, it's not what Paul's saying. Their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, not at all. For we have previously 
charge both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. All have turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongues, they have practiced deceit. Their poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God in their eyes. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. We have to know there that there is a judgment to come. We're going to have to stand before a living God in the end. So we should have a reverent fear of God now and know that we have to stand in judgment before him. We better be putting our faith and trust in Jesus. And we can have victory. We can fulfill the righteous requirement of the law by following after the Lord in a relationship of love. And in love, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Yes, it proves our love says now we know that whatever the law says it says to those who are under the law and that every mouth may be stopped that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is one of the most important verses in all the scripture. Romans 3.23 all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us, every one of us, being justified freely by His grace, made just before God by His grace, a free gift through the redemption. And the redemption is the purchase of us and our soul that is in Christ Jesus through God, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. The propitiation is the payment. He made a payment through his blood for our sins that God may pass over them right to descent de to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus so just put your faith in him where's the boasting then it is excluded by what law or works no, not by the law of faith. Not by the law or by the works, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Jews and the Gentiles? Yes, the Gentiles also, since there is one God 
and who will justify the circumcised by faith and this uncircumcised by faith. So both the circumcised and the uncircumcised are justified by faith. Do we then make the law void through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law by faith. By faith, we say that the law is good, the law is holy, it proves who we are, and that we need to come to Jesus Christ by faith. So, you who are condemning the people who are committing the, the acts that Romans talks about in chapter 1 and chapter 2, the vile works of the flesh that we won't talk about again today, but we'll talk about them again later, those vile works, we can't condemn them because we are condemned under the same law. And so, we, as Paul said right, rightfully, don't uh, condemn them because we're guilty of the same thing. We're guilty of breaking the law of God. All of his sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so we're justified through Jesus, who is death for us. I pray that you'll hold tight to that this weekend. I got a chance to witness to a young man in an Uber car today since my van broke down. and is in the shop, who, which I was going to take to Georgia for a funeral of my friend. But now I'm not going to be going. And I was kind of torn about taking this time away from the work that the Lord was doing with me here in Maryland anyway. And so I have to excuse myself from that. But we'll talk to the family tomorrow. And uh, oh, it's going to be a tough call. But the Lord knows what he's doing. And so I got up today and my van's transmission was going out very early. 45,000 miles Never have had a transmission problem at 45,000 miles. Uh, it's amazing. But, as amazing as it is, God's in control. And that's what I'm thankful for. I hope that you'll be blessed this weekend. And you will bless somebody else. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you will be in the house of the Lord this weekend. And, uh and worship him and thank you for watching this evening and be blessed now amen